Hello my dear students and welcome to this lecture series by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Technical U University Lucknow. Uh, my name is Dr. Supriya Furalatpam. I am an assistant professor in the department of civil engineering in BBD ITM. I will be taking unit 3 of environmental engineering KCE 603 for you and this is my fourth lecture. In our last, uh, uh, last three lectures, we have talked about physical characteristics and chemical characteristics of water. We have not yet finished chemical characteristics of water. Last uh, we what we did was we did fluoride content of water. We will be continuing with the next slide which will be metal and other compounds. So, you know uh, this water pot, uh, portable water they may contain lots of metals and they may also contain lots of compounds. Why? Because water is actually a as you have may have heard many times universal water is actually a universal solvent right. So, it is going to dissolve anything, it can dissolve anything. So, for other metals, so uh, for metals and other compounds tests are conducted on potable water in order to determine the amount of various metals and other substances like iron, manganese, copper, lead barium, cadmium, arsenic, selenium, etcetera present in water. Water may have lots and lots of different types of metals and may other compounds. So, this all this has to be uh, checked when we go for a portable water. We do not generally uh, check for each and everything. What we do is that for example, if you have an industry which may be secreting, uh, which may be uh, using you know which may have F, uh, cadmium or arsenic or some other metal in their effluents and if you water if and if you are staying near them then they will check for that generally. So, you will see if the what is the level of cadmium right. So, this is happening the amount of this minerals and metals in portable water are limited by the permissible limit. So, we have already talked about IS code 10500 well, so, this code is we will we'll be talking about it later onwards also. So, this code is going to give us what are the limits like how much ever is acceptable, how much is permissible means after a level what type of what portable water, what drinking water will be rejected. You are not supposed to drink it. If you drink well, a limit, uh, if you drink water which has um, more than the permissible limit, what will happen? You are going to fall sick, you are going to be ill, All right. Toxic metals may uh, dissolve in water that may dissolve in water include arsenic, barium, cadmium, chromium, lead, mercury, and silver. Okay. And of this, arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury are particularly hazardous as they bioaccumulate in the food chain. So, this arsenic, cadmium, chromium, lead, mercury, silver, all, all are heavy metals. Okay. So, they are very very toxic. So, say for example, uh, if you go to Bangladesh and if you go to West Bengal, okay, what will you see? You will see that the ground water is generally infested with arsenic and people there have very very strong cases of skin cancers, skin cancers, they have kidney problems their hands and uh, their hands will be will have lots of uh, souls because of this. So, what are they caused by? They are caused by very high level of arsenic and this arsenic is geological in nature like it was already present in their uh, ground water. So, what will they do? They when they drink this ground water and uh, so what will they do not have any other alternate source of water. So, they generally drink this ground water because of this ground water this uh, arsenic will enter their body and over a period of time they cause very very huge problems like skin cancer, kidney uh, failure lots and lots of other illness. Then you have cadmium what will happen cadmium will cause chromium 
mercury, silver, all of this will cause very, very major problems. Uh, there is a disease called itai itai disease in this was seen in Japan. This was caused due to cadmium. So, right. So, this was caused due to high presence of high amount of cadmium in their water source. So, all these metals even though they may not be present everywhere, they will be present only at located only small small locations, but if they are present those population will be extremely affected by this, um, this metals. Then at the same time arsenic, cadmium, lead and mercury they are particularly hazardous as they bioaccumulate in the food chain. Here we have a term called bioaccumulate. What is bio bioaccumulation? You people should go and check it in the internet or anywhere should read a book on bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation is a very important term when we talked about food chains. Bioaccumulation it means that see when you uh, when you eat something or you drink something what will happen is that generally it is going to be uh, the body is going to it is good the waste is going to go through your uh, through your body secretions maybe it may be through sweat or it may be through your uh, you know excreta or through your feces or through your urine, but these metals they are going to remain in their body in your body it is not going to go out like once it enters the body it is going to stay there it is not going to. So, what will happen it is going to accumulate it is going to accumulate over time not only through time through your food chain say for example, you have say. Uh, this is the food chain. Okay, let us talk. Say there her here the first one we have zooplankton. Okay. So this zooplankton let us say is eaten by small fish. May say that this small fish is being eaten by big fishes, and say this big fish is being eaten by a man. Okay. So, the, we are talking about the food chain here in a say let us talk about a lake. So, let us say that this is being occurring in a lake. Okay. So, lakes have a particular food chain. First, we have the zooplankton or the phytoplankton or whatever okay. the initial the, the primary where the starting. Then imagine that this be, these are being eaten by small fishes, the small fishes are being eaten by big fishes and finally, the big fishes will be caught by a man and he is going to consume that fish with his family. Okay. Now, what is going to happen? If this lake is infested by say mercury, okay, what is going to happen? This is what exactly is going to happen in bioaccumulation. So, this zooplankton imagine zooplankton let us talk about in numbers okay we we are we're going to uh, simplify everything we're simply going to talk in numbers not in anything some so for example zoo one one zooplankton is having one mercury okay let's talk one mercury one zooplankton okay this small fish in its lifetime say they he has thousand zooplanktons okay one thousand zooplanktons one small fish. So, how so since this is this will bioaccumulate this it is going to so what will happen once this small fish eats this. So, one small fish will have now 1000 zooplankton which translates to 1000 mercury. Okay. zooplankton so here one mercury okay small fish one small fish has imagine 1000 zooplankton so one zooplankton has one mercury one small fish has will have 1000 mercury this small fish will be eaten by a big fish okay so imagine this big fish in its lifetime has 
before it is caught and eaten by the man has had imagine it has 100 small fishes ok. So, one small fish has 100, 1000 mercury, one big fish will have 100 into 1000 mercury. So, how much? 1 lakh mercury ok, we are simply talking in terms of numbers. Imagine a man ok, he has in his lifetime say 100 fishes, 100 big fishes ok. So, one big fish will have 1 lakh mercury into 100. So, what was happening? 10 to the power 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7 mercury. So, what are you seeing? You are seeing that as you grow up, as you go up the food chain, if you go up here, the amount of mercury is increasing as you go up the food chain. So, that is what is called bioaccumulate in the food chain, it is bioaccumulating, it is accumulating from 1 to 10 to the power 7, ok. So, that is what is happening. So, <clears throat> Now, let us come to the next topic. At the same time, another uh, important metals uh, is iron and manganese in concentration greater than 0 0.3 ppm and 0 0.05 ppm respectively are undesirable and they may cause discolorations of workloads was in such waters. They may also cause incrustation of watermans. So, what happened? Watermans will be so you are investing so much money on uh, putting watermans and they will be causing incrustation due to deposition of ferric hydroxide and manganese oxide. High concentrations of copper are likely to affect human uh, uh, lungs and other respiratory organs. Sulfur concentrations more than 250 ppm may cause laxative infect in humans, right. So, these are the all the problems which may be caused by uh, metals and other compounds. The last, uh, uh, the last topic for chemical uh, characteristics of water is dissolved gases. We won't be talking a lot about dissolved gases. I'll be just telling you that there are various uh, gases which may get dissolved in water due to its contact with the atmosphere. So, you have the fusion here, right? Atmosphere will have nitrogen, oxygen many things. So, when you have a water body, it is going to go for diffusion, right. So, by this diffusion, you will have dissolved gases. So, due to its contact with the atmosphere or ground surface includes nitrogen, methane, hydrogen sulphide, carbon dioxide and obviously oxygen, which is the most important. So, we will be talking about dissolved oxygen in the uh, after some time that is this oxygen will be dissolved in water. So, it is called there is amount in portable water should not exceed 5 to 10 ppm right. If it is less than uh, 4 ppm fish kills will happen like fishes will start dying. Now, let us come to the bacteriological characteristics. Okay. So, we have talked about the physical characteristics of water and the chemical characteristics of water and well let us come to the bacteriological characteristics of water. So, most bacteria are harmless, most of the bacteria which is present in water they are harmless and they are hence they are called non-pathogenic bacteria. However, there are certain bacteria which are pathogenic or which may cause you illness and cause serious waterborne diseases like typhoid, okay, cholera, typhoid, infect, uh, infectious hepatitis, such bacteria are called pathogenic bacteria or pathogens. Okay. Pathogenic bacteria can be det uh, detected and enumerated in lab, but with time consuming and lengthy process which is generally not routinely done. So, you can actually do lab tests, but it is going to be a lengthy process. So, what we do? So, we want, uh, uh, yeah, we want a way out, we want something with which we will be able to know there are pathogens present in the water at the same time uh, it will be easier for us easy for to, to uh, easy for us to do at the same time not time consuming. So, we have got a way for this, this way is routine tests involve detecting and counting non pathogenic indicator organisms principally coliform groups that is total coliform and fecal coliform. So, what we have seen is that 
when this pathogenic bacteria are present. At the same time, with long with this pathogenic bacteria, there may be some bacteria which are already always present with them. Like saath saath mein rehte hain type group of friends. You must be seeing some group group of people who are always there. So these are those types of bacteria. They are always there together. So if A is present, if this um, pathogenic bacteria is present along with that pathogenic bacteria, some indicator organism will also be present. Some indicator bacteria will be present. and that bacteria is very easily you can easily detect it so if you detect that bacteria you can say with you know with 100 per like with conviction that that uh, that but uh, this pathogenic bacteria may also be present right so uh, so we generally detect those indicator organisms as they are easy to detect so what are those indicator organisms they are coliform the coliform groups coliforms are rod shape non pathogenic coliform actually are not pathogenic bacteria they is not going to cause any type of uh, you know uh, any type of disease or you're not going to fall sick because of them whose presence or absence in water indicate the presence or absence of fecal pollution right fecal, what do you mean by fecal pollution fecal pollution means that that water may have some sort of you know uh human feces or animal feces right and hence of the pathogens right so what are coliforms all aerobic facultative and anaerobic gram negative non spore forming rod shaped bacteria that ferment lactose with gas formation within 40 at hours at 35 degrees centigrade are called coliform bacteria okay so they are this bacteria you have to uh, frankly telling you have to remember this whole green one i have just it's like marked it mark this up okay very important so let me uh, try to uh, make things little bit easier for it all aerobic so what are aerobic bacteria what are aerobic bacteria are those bacteria which what what will they do they are those bacteria which uses oxygen right they are going to do all their work all their degradation in the presence of oxygen so presence of oxygen right what are anaerobic bacteria anaerobic bacteria will be so what did i tell about aerobic they are going to do their work in the presence of oxygen and what about anaerobic bacteria and aerobic same as aerobic but an not exactly opposite as aerobic so no oxygen right so they are going to do their work they are going to degrade in the absence of oxygen so here aerobic in the presence of oxygen anaerobic in the um, in the absence of oxygen so what is facultative facultative is both ways so what will fatal facultative bacteria do they are going to if there is oxygen they will use oxygen if there is oxygen is not present they will not use oxygen so aerobic bacteria can work only in the presence of oxygen facultative bacteria can work in the presence of oxygen if it is there once the oxygen is finished they will move on to their anaerobic state right they will work anaerobically and anaerobic as you can say they will not work uh, they they are going to work in the absence of oxygen so all types of bacteria aerobic facultative and anaerobic they are gram negative non spore forming rod shaped bacteria that ferment lactose right with gas formation within 48 hours at 35 degrees centigrade are called coliform bacteria okay now <clears throat> for this the specific indicators are specific indicator of fecal coliform subgroup of total coliform a very uh, commonly used indicator is e coli right very very e easy e coli it's very i think you people must have heard it many times e coli right detection of e coli in drinking water is taken as evidence of recent pollution with human or animal feces so if you see that if say if i have a sample of water and uh, i test it for uh, e coli and if i see that e coli is present then i will say that this water has seen a recent a recent pollution it has uh, some some sort of uh, 
you know animal feces or human feces and it is not you are not supposed to drink it. So, we will reject it. If it is not there then we may do another uh, test and we may say ki haan, this is actually clean and you can drink it right. So, how do we test? So, how do we test? We test uh, by this MPN test. It is a very important test. I think you people, some people must have obviously heard about it. Uh, it is actually a very, very important test. It is called MPS test, MPN test. So, what is MPN? MPN is most probable number or MPS analysis, right? MPN here is most probable number. So, MPN test or MPN analysis is a stat uh, statistical base method based on the random dispersion of microorganisms per volume in a given sample, right. So, it is a statistical test. What so MPN is like, uh, okay, we will talk about it later. So, in this method, measured volumes of water is added to a series of tubes containing a liquid indicator growth medium. The media receiving one or more indicator bacteria source growth and a characteristic color changes. Color change is absent in those receiving an inoculum of water without indicator bacteria. From the number and the distribution of positive and negative reactions, the MPN of the indicator organisms in the sample may be estimated by reference to a statistical table. We have an MPN test, okay. We have an NPN test which shows ki this much is there, then if this is the value, then this is going to be the result, right. So, what actually is happening in MPN test is that you have this sample of water, okay. This is original sample of water which you have collected for which you have to do uh, the MPN test. So, what will you do? You are going to inoculate. Inoculate in the sense, what do you mean by inoculate? Inoculate in the sense, you are going to put. Uh, you are going to say you are going to put this uh, uh, the sample matlab you are going to make sure you are going to make sure it is growing okay you go inoculate in a sense inoculate with uh, you are going to make uh, that sample of water to see if it has bacteria or not right. so what will happen is that this in, they are going to inoculate so what will happen we are going to use different amounts of water a uh, different amount of sample here Okay, so this uh, this series of uh, test tubes will have a particular amount of uh, medium, or as you can say, media. Okay, so they will have media, and they are going to inoculate it with this sample. Means they are going to see uh, this is the sample. I'm going to think that I'm uh, imagining that I, uh, I I'm thinking that this has some bacteria. So I'm going to inoculate it with this bacteria, right? This so so here, and when it is if it is a positive sample and then they are going to incubate it for a particular time at a particular temperature and if it is positive there is going to show that the color is changing if it is color is not changing color is not changing okay then it means that the bacteria is not there so that is how you do it mpn so mpn test is completed in three steps so we have three types of steps in this one is the presumptive test uh, next is the confirmatory test, another is the completed test. Now, uh, let us come to the three tests of MPN that is presumptive, confirmed and completed. In presumptive test, what we do is, it is used for detection and estimation of coliform in phase wa own water sample. For estimation of coliform, lactose containing broth medium is used. Commonly used medium is McConkey broth that contains the indicator bromocresol purple and inverted Durham tube is placed. This is the Durham tube, okay. The color of media changes into yellow and on collection of gas in Durham tube bacteria are assumed to be coliform. The number of positive tubes are counted and referred to the standard chart to find MPN of total 100 ml water sample, okay. So, uh, this is the presumptive test. So once after you finish the presumptive test, we can go for the confirmed test. In the confirmed test, some spore forming uh, bacteria gives false positive test in presumptive test. Confirmed test is done to determine that the coliforms are of fecal origin or not and if they are E. coli or not. So, you want to confirm if it is actually E. coli or if it is actually uh, fecal origin or not, right. 
for this positive presumptive uh, for this positive presumptive tests are inoculated, uh, inoculated in selective media like eosin methyl blue agar and incubated at two temperatures that is 44.5 degree centigrade and 37 degree centigrade. Presence of typical colonies at 37 degree centigrade confirms positive coliform test and those at 44.5 confirms the presence of E. coli. And after this uh, we have the completed test here, subculture uh, the, here it con uh, consists of subculture typical colonies in lactose containing media. So, here we will use a lactose containing media and obviously it is also incubated at 2 temperatures that is 37 degree centigrade and 44.5 degree centigrade. Presence of E. coli is confirmed by production of gas at 44 degree centigrade. So, with this we have finished MPN test, uh, thank you for listening to me, have a very good day.